No one needs convincing that generosity can bless those on the receiving end. But what about the one on the giving end? Might it be that growing in generosity is followed by growing in joy? To help us explore this, today we welcome special guest Jeff Wallace. Jeff started his career fast out of the gate and went on to some impressive accomplishments in the financial industry. But Jeff's life direction shifted as he began to reflect deeply on the difference between financial success and life significance. In 2017, his journey brought him to join one of the largest charitable foundations in the country. Now he gets to spend his days talking with others, beginning or extending their own journeys of generosity, and helping them evaluate the optimal tax strategies and mechanisms to see that generosity expressed. Stay tuned as Jeff helps us explore real-life stories on all this and more right now on the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I'm your co-host, Roshan Langani, here with Adrian Nicholson and Eric Olson today. We also have a special guest. Guest, I'm really excited to uh, have with us. Jeff Wallace is joining us. And Eric, you know you know Jeff. You've got uh, an introduction ready for him. Please introduce him to, to everybody. Oh, yeah. Well, so Jeff, I, I can't remember the first time that you and I um, ran into each other. I'm thinking it was at one of the Kingdom Advisor conferences down in Orlando. But it might have been instead at one of the events that you and others of, at National Christian Foundation in Chicago have hosted, uh, where you've brought in portfolio managers and others to talk about what they're doing and, and, and brought in advisors to hear, you know, kind of what's up and what's happening there. And so I think it, I can't remember which of those, but I know it's been within the last three years that I've gotten to know you and get to know the rest of uh, the team that you're part of in a better way. And so uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So for our listeners, I want to just highlight uh, National Christian Foundation is one of the largest charitable foundations in the country. If I'm not mistaken, it's about number four. And uh, so it's a, it's a it's an entity which has served me and is not only me, but also a lot of my clients well insofar as that one of the um, avenues they make available for people who want to get not only to be um, generous, but also to get a tax benefit from their generosity is uh, something known as a donor advised fund. And so both uh, in my wife's and my own case, as well as in a number of our clients' cases, we've we've turned to National Christian Foundation for help with that. Although that's just, you know, just to, to just to recognize that it's part of a larger ecosystem there. So Jeff has a has an interesting background before coming to National Christian Foundation. And uh, th that was an, in 2017, he had his own firm and uh, and their their work was to purchase rehab and then manage a portfolio of single family homes. He'd also had time in the financial industry as an auditor at Arthur Anderson. He'd been working as a derivative, a derivatives trader in Chicago and in Hong Kong. I'd love to hear that story at some point too, Jeff, because I spent a couple of years in China. And, uh, and then was also uh, leading various firms, including a technology integration firm, a really large multi-strategy hedge fund, and so forth and so on. So at one point, Jeff read a book. And that book was by Bob Buford and it was called Halftime. And, and that and other influences in his life led him to a point where he sort of changed directions and has really been focused uh, in alignment with that on helping other people who've had amazing careers and at least from the standpoint of financial success, help them translate that financial success in also into something more than just financial success, but also into significance. And so, Jeff, we were just learning from you that you're now living in South Carolina. You've been married for 25 plus years, three, three da four daughters, three at the uh, University of South Carolina. Uh, what, a, what a great story. Thanks so much for joining us. And if I left something out, you can throw that in. You, you got all the highlights. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Four daughters. That's the big deal. 23 22, 20, and 18. Oh, wow. And so that, that keeps you busy, but everybody wants to talk about weddings. I don't know why, but that's what everybody <laughs> wants to go to. 
<laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, well, that's uh, really great. I have, as a father of two daughters, uh, not four, but two, I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah, it's a, it's a unique place to be. <laughs> so, Jeff, we uh, we have a number of questions for you, and 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 listeners, I want to just kind of talk about what it is that we why we thought it would be valuable to talk with Jeff. Um, as you've heard us talk about in many previous podcasts, whether it's been sort of a, we, a direct approach on this subject or it's been ancillary to some of the other things that we've discussed, uh, we're big believers in in looking for ways to have uh, an impact in the world. And we're also big believers in looking at ways to um, ha finding happiness hacks, if you will. And mm. uh, the intersection of both of those two things, having an impact in the world and a happiness hack is generosity. And so uh, Jeff is here uh, to talk with us about, first of all, the why even have a conversation about generosity what's i mean the normal way that we think about this is what's in it for the recipients of that generosity but there's also the question which we shouldn't just be inattentive to is what what benefit does the giver derive from generosity and then after we've talked about that we also want to then talk about some specific mechanisms that exist for you to not only um, express your generosity in ways that are savvy from a, from a giving standpoint, but also savvy from a tax standpoint. And, and the, there's a lot of, uh, of our listeners who are, who are really, their generosity consists in the form of just consistent ongoing cash giving. But there are other of our listeners who have large illiquid assets, and that at some point there's going to be an event with that asset. And so, uh, one of the things that some of these strategies that we'll talk about will help listeners like that do is uh, be able to have to magnify the impact of their gift by minimizing the tax impact the, upon them um, for having developed a, a highly valuable asset of that kind. So, uh, Jeff, why don't we why don't we get started? What is let's just talk about generosity in general and. And why is generosity something even worth having a conversation about? And, and you know, what impact does it have on the giver? Okay. Well, first off, thanks so much for having me today to come talk to you guys. And, and, and just the idea of talking about generosity. Um, the big thing I always say to people, I'm like, I, it's not religious. It's not anything else. How many people raise their hand and want to be happy? Yeah. You know, how many people want to be happy? Who wants a sincere joy in their life and if you look at there's all kinds of studies if any of you go to google as my grand as my father-in-law who lives with me says you know google what google what i'm like just type in generosity and happiness and you'll see that there's all kinds of studies that have been done over the last 25 years uh, as recent as the last couple of years some really neat things have come out and they specifically take it down to areas of the brain that by you being generous, all right, that's just like, and that's not, and everyone wants to talk about money. We're not just talking about dollars, right? We're talking about your time, right? How much, what are you doing for people? By doing that, and they say, they even take it down to this, uh, I just read a study earlier this morning, getting ready for this, on this idea of a targeted group. So that would be a group that you know, not necessarily just family or friends. It could be a charity, but you really know that group well. And what it does is it actually affects your brain. And, and they go through this study and it basically comes out and says, if you do these things, right, if you give to a targeted group, someone you know, someone you care about, what happens? You feel better. Very simple. It's a very, it's a pretty in-depth study. Mm. And so I talk to anybody about it. I'm like, why wouldn't you want to feel happy? So if you want to feel happy, one way to do that, I'm not saying it's the only way, but one way to do it consistently is to be generous. And that gener generosity, everyone wants to talk about cash or giving checks or, or real estate or whatever it might be. But I'm like, but it's also your time. Mm -hmm. What are you doing for those around you, for people, and for more important, for the people you don't know? You know, it's that city, what's the, it's that one commercial they talk about, they just show different random acts of kindness and how it affects the day of all these people. Well, that's a really neat thing. So that's, that's kind of what I, I have the luckiest job in the world. I get to talk to people about this all day and every day. Hmm. And most importantly, I get to hear their stories. I get to hear what they have passion for and then how we can help them to give more 
to those things they have they care about. Actually, that's great. Jeff. And Jeff, can you uh, sh- share one of these stories? Because you brought up uh, consistency, and I think that's really important when it comes to generosity. Because let's just say this is just new, or somebody wants to help out more or give more. So let's just say the first year they want to be generous. They're being very generous. They're doing a lot more, taking some more time out. But they want to have this be a more consistent part of their life and they don't have a plan set up or have tools or a target group in mind. Sometimes that can, you know, slowly fall off where they have to pick it back up again. So can you maybe share some stories where you saw somebody had like a consistent approach or they really use generosity in a way not only to benefit benefit themselves to become more happy, but helping out a, a target group? I think our listeners would really find a lot of value in that seeing a real life example and a consistent plan that really played out over the long term. So one of the keys to being generous is being intentional, right? We have to be intentional about the things that we want to do in our life, right? I actually this morning started off in a small group with seven other men, and we're reading a book right now. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. (laughs) All right. It's by John Mark Comer. And it's a wonderful book because like the big thing that I got out of the first, we read the first 50 pages, uh, was just this idea of, all the bad things that have happened to me as a husband that I've been a part of as a husband, as a partner, as a business leader, as a friend, as a father, usually was done in my haste, right? And so even in in this idea of generosity, I'd say being intentional, stopping and thinking about it. You guys are all in the private wealth. And it's one of the things I, I'm a bad, I'm a, I'm a great case for any private wealth person that says, here's how bad you can be when you don't have a private wealth advisor, someone just to talk through and think through things. Right. And so the same thing here, and I have a great story and I always, I'll admit, I use this story a lot and it was early on. So five years ago, July, I started working with NCF. And I'm not going to get emotional about this, but I had a couple I was working with. And I've just just recently met this couple and uh, he owned a business. He had done a large gift three or four years prior to myself joining NCF. And what did he do? He gave a piece, a piece of a private business. So he it was an LLC. So he gave units to NCF. And actually what he was doing was he had other partners in the business. So what he did was he gave that to NCF. And then what we ended up doing is we sold that back to some of his partners. So he was working himself out of the business, right? How was he doing that? He wanted to give ownership to his other partners. So what happens was he gave us a piece of that. So he got a valuation appraisal. He got a large deduction. And then more importantly, we sold it back to the company to give to the owners, the other owners. And what happened? Now these dollars are in his donor advice fund. And the neatest thing was we were in our final meeting on it, final meeting. And I've only met the wife one time before on a phone call, never been in a room with her and we're talking. And I didn't know the story, but basically she said she started telling us a story about there's a there's a dump that many of you probably know outside of Nairobi. It's a pretty famous garbage dump. Mm. All right. It's one of the largest in the world. There's a whole city basically of slums built around this garbage dump. Well, they had been there on a mission trip like 10 years earlier. They'd been supporting a single a single missionary there that works there, that works with these people. Long and short, after the last gift, they started thinking about what they could do more. And this gift was in the millions. And I know we always like to talk about big numbers, but this one was. So what did they do? They actually gave the dollars to this mission and opened up an orphanage Mm -hmm. outside of this dump. Okay. So here's what got me. I'm a numbers guy, right? I'm a quantitative derivatives trader, CPA. I'm all about numbers. Well, here's the number she gave me. We were going through the numbers of how much they were going to save by giving it this way. She took it down and she equated to the number of orphans that she could take into her orphanage outside of this dump. Hmm. And I'm sitting there. I'm probably, I think I was maybe nine months, a year into this and And I'm kind of like, it was the most humbling thing to me. I sat there and said, how do I have the opportunity to hear this story and be a a very, very small part of what this couple is trying to do, right? And and it was neat. I mean, this couple, it's very private for them. They are not a couple that's going to go out and let people know that, like, like, you know, putting their name on things or things like this. This was just something, this was her thing. That was the other thing I'd also tell you. I'm sure you guys hear it oftentimes. I've spent a lot of my time with private wealth advisors is that the generosity part, it's very, you just don't know who, there's usually a driver in a marriage. There's one or the other usually. 
And oftentimes I'll go into a meeting thinking I know, oh, the generosity is driven by him or no, the generosity. Is... This was a couple I totally thought it was him because he had done some large projects that his name did get on. But this was like she just melted talking about this orphanage. Mm. Right. So that's that's the type of thing for me when I get to see that uh, I get to be a part, a very small part of what people are trying to do in the world. And so that's one I always go back to. And I have plenty of there's very well-known stories that are people have given large businesses and they're doing amazing things down to just just small things where, hey, I'm, I'm helping, you know, everybody can raise their hand if they've ever sponsored a child. Right. It's, a, you know, it's sixteen dollars, twenty dollars, whatever it might be. But when you're stalking, even when you're doing some little things like we work with a lot of everyday givers, I call them everyday givers. Everyday givers are people that are giving less than $25,000 a year, right? They might be giving $5,000 a year, $10,000 a year to different things, right? Well, there are still things that we can teach them. It's nothing to do with how NCF is going to help them or anything like that. It's more of, hey, if you just do this, right? One of those things might be bunching. I don't know if you guys have ever heard someone talk about bunching, right? It's right now because of the way the standard deduction of what you get on your taxes, right? $24,000 for a married couple, $12,000 for an individual. Well, in certain years, if you're up near that limit and you have those dollars, you can do something by giving a little bit more to a donor advised fund, which I call your charitable checking account. Get the deduction this year. Well, what's that going to do? It's going to take your taxes down, Right. And then I might have, I have some kids out of Wheaton College, 10 of them. They actually, they, they get together one time a year. They've been out of school three or four years. They get out of time one time a year. They each put as much money they can into their donor advice fund. This They share a donor advice fund. They put as much money and they all get together for a week and they think, and they talk about what's moved them during the year that they want to support. Mm. So not only do they support it, they also have to visit it. So they want their hands and feet. They call it their hands and feet. They want their hands and feet to be involved in the project. So they've done some really neat things. Great story. I don't know if you guys have ever been down in the inner city of Chicago. I know a couple of you are from Virginia. Eric, you're in Chicago. Uh, but if you go in the inner city of Chicago, any inner city in the United States, right, there's plenty of places to help, right? Well, there's a place called Lawndale in Chicago. And there's this great guy that graduated from Wheaton College. His name's they call him Coach. Wayne Gordon's his name. Uh, he's got a great church down there, Lawndale Christian Church. He's got the health center. But what they did was they worked with the justice mission and they actually supported an attorney. What they decided to do was to support an attorney that was representing two young men that ended up being charged with a, a robbery that they were there, but they were not part of it. Right. So they got very, very specific to pay this outside counsel because the justice mission needed it. And you should hear the way they talked about what they were doing there. Right. So there's all kinds. And I could go on for hours. and I know I can't hear. But I'm just telling you, people, there's all kinds of people that are thinking through these things they care about. And it might be something that just catches it today. But let me tell you, whatever that might be, it's going to make them happier. And if we can help them do it, I'm going to help them do it. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a God, that's a couple of great stories there. Jeff, can you tell us a little bit? You mentioned this briefly um, while we were getting all the uh, equipment set up for our call today. Can you tell us a little bit about ba about your background? You had talked about, mentioned from private jets, now uh, helping people with the donor advised funds. Can you give us a little bit of that story and how generosity has impacted your life? Yeah, so uh, so Jeff Jeff Wallace, so uh, University of Illinois CPA, Arthur Anderson for a couple of years. Many of you people don't even know what Arthur Anderson is anymore. There's a big <laughs> accounting firm. I've uh, worked there for a couple of years, and I had a couple some friends that were trading. And I was like, boy, they work a lot less hours and make a lot more money. And that was who Jeff was about. Jeff had goals. My goals were I wanted to be worth a million dollars by the time I was 25. I wanted to be worth 10 million by the time I was 30. And I wanted to be worth 100 million by the time I was 40. That was my goal. Nothing about generosity. I grew up in the church, but that was my goal. I had reached the first three and on, I was working towards number four. But I, so I got in the trading industry. We started a trading firm. We ended up with a large hedge fund. And I thought, well, I, I got it now. Jeff knows a lot of things. Well, as, as, and I'm not saying God tries to do, is not trying to do bad things to anybody. But for Jeff, Jeff needed to be humbled. And I was significantly humbled. It blew up. It blew up around me. It blew up kind of after I left, but it still blew up. And that whole world changed. It changed big time. I went, 
on to trading and I kept trading, but I also started doing different things along with it. And I had a very good friend and I would tell anybody having other people in your life, iron sharpens iron. Very simple. That's a well-known, a well-known concept, right? Having those people around you. I had a very good friend who passed away a year ago, Gordon Murphy, and he's, he's affected a lot of people I know. In fact, his funeral last year, he had 1,100 people come to his funeral. Wow. And the one thing I said, I go, I might have 10. And I got a family of, of six. Ah. So that's not that great, right? So I just I just see the impact that he had. But this is a guy, and I'm going to tell one Gordon story that just tells you how the impact he had. As a 70, he died at 74. At 70 years old, he grew up playing baseball. He never made it to the bigs. He went to Elmhurst College, small school outside Chicago. Went to the baseball coach, said, I'd love to be an unpaid assistant. I just want to be around young men and help them. So what he did was he drove the bus, all right? Drove the bus for these kids to their games. You know, and this is Elmer's College, small school. So they're driving all around Illinois, Wisconsin, but they do an annual trip down south. He would always call me before the trip. And before the trip, when he'd go down south, he'd have some scripture in his mind. He goes, I'm going to get to talk to these young men about these things. This was my his goal. So, A, what was he doing? He was being intentional. He was intentional in putting himself in the position, right? Well, the neatest thing was at this funeral, there were 36 kids from Elmhurst baseball team oh, wow. that went to his funeral. All right. And he this guy this guy did more for me than anything. During the time when things were going well for me, and this is what you were talking about earlier, Gordon used to say, Hey, I love your checks. Jeff, your checks are great. He ran some large charities, but he'd always tell me, he goes, but your heart, he goes, your network, it can do way more in the world that I'm working in. He ran Opportunity International at one point. He did a lot of different things. He goes, it can do way more than those checks with the zeros that you're writing to me. And it always, that I always go back to that now. So my world's changed completely. I traded, I, God's bless us very, I mean, bless us beyond belief. But now it's a whole different world. I work for a charity, so I'm 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 like I'm counting every dime I, I I have to to for our family. And so now, and I always tell people there's a great story. It's uh I'm actually I hope you don't mind if I get biblical on you, but I'm going to read one thing. Uh, it's Mark 12 41 through 44, and it basically just talks about an older woman. Uh, Jesus is watching people in the temple go in, and some very rich people went in and they gave a lot. And he's like, well, they just gave out of their plenty. They gave out of their plenty, which to me was not that big a deal. And for my, this is me personally, back then, it wasn't that big to me. I could write that check and whatever. Didn't change my world. Didn't change anything, anybody around me. But then he talks about a little old woman that goes in and gives basically the equivalent of two small copper coins. They call them drachma, right? He gave those two coins. And he said, she gave more than anybody else here today, right? Because she gave out of her poor or what she doesn't have. Right. And so I try to stress that. I try to stress that. And that's when my friend Gordon, Gordon worked in charity all of his life. You know, it wasn't like he, but you know what? He knew he had time. So even after he retired, two things he would say, and these other guys I'm in the small group talk about it a lot. He didn't move to Florida because all of his grandkids were in the Western suburbs. What did he do? He picked them up from school. He spent time with them. The other thing he did was he took, he carved out one day a week, he wanted to meet with men that were under the age of 40 and just talk to them about their walk. Just how could he spend time with them? How can I help you? Like he used to say, let's go to breakfast. I want to talk about ways I can help you. And I, I look at people. It's like, oh, you only think people of plenty can do things. And it's like, no, you're missing the point. You can do so much with so little. And I think in the, in, in, in the good book and when we think about our faith, that's what the good Lord wants to see. He wants to see you give out of your poorness of what you don't have. And if you're willing to do that, now I think you've done some amazing things. Hmm. That's a great story. That's a great story. So Jeff, you told you know some of your story of kind of moving from one, one way of perceiving generosity and being engaged with it to another. And I'm sure now five years or so here at NCF, You've just been building on that. What would you say if if people were trying to think about their own, our listeners were thinking about their own generosity journey, what would you say is, you've said, be intentional. That's one thing that they could do. 
what do you what do you see some other things about that seem to characterize people who who make progress on that journey of generosity are uh, uh, in addition to being intentional are there other things that would would be an assist to our listeners the the most amazing stories i see and it's actually probably the number one question i get from older couples uh, is how do they bring their family along in that journey mm. right and and it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to do but when you see it done it's an amazing picture the joy and happiness in families that practice generosity together mm. it's an amazing thing so my friend uh gordon uh, one of the things he he got me to do was I, ta- I I I cooked breakfast in a homeless shelter. We did it for twenty. I did it for twenty years hmm. before I moved out of Chicago. Hmm. He and his friends that are part of my small group they've did it for thirty five years. Wow! And he always ta- it was just once a month, so not like we had to get up. I have always gotten up early. We went over at five o'clock in the morning. We were done by seven thirty. It's not that big a deal. But if I tell anybody I did something like that for 20 some years, they'd be like, oh, my gosh, you know, how did you do? It's like, well, A, I needed to have the right group of friends around me Uh that would push me because there are plenty of days I didn't want to go and I'll I'll be up front. Plenty of times that one day. Oh, gosh. But I got to tell you, that's the day that I talked to one gentleman or I saw one woman with a child. My friend Gordon used to shield me because I had little kids and it'd kill me when I'd see. Uh, couples or women come in with little kids into this homeless shelter. This is a roaming homeless shelter called Pads. It's in the western suburbs of Chicago. It's the oldest roaming shelter in the world. Mm. Okay, oldest in the world, and it's just amazing to me. In the western, this is like the western suburbs of Chicago. This is a very well-to-do area, but yet homelessness was a really real issue. But my point being is that I went. You know, all thinking about me. Oh God, I got so many things to do. Why am I doing this? But then I'd leave. I would feel so good, so much better because one story, something came out of that morning where, and I would, that's what I go out. And so that's why I tell everybody about my job now. I don't know what's going to happen that day, but I can tell you almost every day something touches me in a way that I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Let's, let's recenter. Let's do it. So that's, I guess that's, so being intentional and with your family, it's, being intentional is really a big part of it. You got to try, right? Because so many of them just don't try. Well, how do I, how do I bring that up to my kids or how do I do that? Well, it's as simple as I have a, I have a, a, a great story for a couple, retired doctor. They had some stories, but they're really not, they really didn't. Well, they have a donor advised fund and they've got a considerable amount of dollars set up in there. So what I said was, Hey, I've got a friend that has set up a donor advice fund and not that much money in, but what he did one year at Thanksgiving, four kids, and they ranged at that point, they were probably from uh, uh, eight years old to 16. So here's what we're going to do, guys. Each of you get, I think it was $500 out of the donor advice fund. This is what we're going to do. You each can give away $500. We're going to do it by the end of the year. I want you to think about it. But at Christmas time, we're all going to get back down to this table. So around right, right around Christmas Day, we're going to get back around our table. And you're going to have to explain to everybody what you want to do, like who do you want to give it to and why. And then what, what good do you think will come from it, right? That was three simple things to kids. And he goes, it was the most amazing stories came out of my kids. A, I never imagined, none of them gave to the things that I gave to. Not one is his story. His name's Bob. And he's like, he goes, I learned so much. And they, you know, so they did that. And now since, as they've grown older, now he has two in college, is that he still does it. But now the number's a little bit bigger. And he's like, we talk about it all the time. Like, hey, Jim, are, what are you going to do this year? Are you still going to do this? Like one of them was a, a basketball program that he participated in that gave scholarships to other kids that his dad never imagined that that's what he wanted to do. So like I'm saying, like, just starting small in some way. So for me, I always say, like, even pads or, like, here, I moved to a new community. I know very few people in my community. But one of the things is, I don't know, there's some, I don't know all the things. It's not Facebook, but something else like that. And they said, hey, what we do is they put the flags up. It's a pretty big community. They put flags up on every flagpole around it before Memorial Day. I moved in April last year. It's May last year. I see this note. I'm like, oh, I could do that. So I signed up to do it. And my daughter's like, where are you going? 
And what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I got to get my ladder. I got to go do this. I'm going to meet somebody, which I got to meet very nice, another older man. And we went up and we put up like 30 flags. And they had like 25 groups of people that were putting flags up, mm. right? But one of the things I say is I hopefully I'm modeling that for my children. And that's what I would say for people as they try to bring their family along. You need to model those things for your kids. Mm. So my friend Gordon did that really well for me. Like I always say, I know when I'm retired, like right now my wife wants to talk to me about, oh, we moved to South Carolina. This is our forever home. And I'm like, forever home? Who knows what tomorrow brings? One thing I've learned is every day is a new day. We'll see what the Lord blesses with me or what what hardships I'm going to have, right? But I don't, I always say, I don't know where my daughters are going to live. I don't know where my grandkids are going to be. Mm-hmm. And we probably will want to move close to them, mm-hmm. right? Or, or be someplace in a community where I can actually do something good. So I don't know if that helps. But the, my point is, is don't, it's hard. Get the right people around you. I always say that. Get people around you, ask questions, and learn. Every day we learn something, right? Mm-hmm. You can learn about generosity too. And that's one thing I would say. So I work for the National Christian Foundation. The neat thing about NCF is a big part of my job is building generous community. How do we build generous community? Well, the number one way is if you learn about marketing, right, is telling stories. So what we're doing right now, telling stories, bringing people together. I think you all know if you've ever been to a church or anything, people don't like talking about money. They don't like, right? Uh, uh, it's uh, Jesus says it's a terrible yoke, right? That's given to people with wealth. And I would agree it is. And most people don't want to talk about it. And I'm not, I know people are like, oh, I feel sorry for someone that's rich. Well, most rich people aren't that happy, just so you know. There's also a study's been done on that, right? So get people around you that you're willing to talk through these issues. The small group that I'm in is called the Camels Group. It was started 35 35- 35 years ago, and it's changed people. But the reason they call it the camel is uh, M. Griffin, who's the head of, was a, a chairman emeritus of the communications department at Wheaton College, gave a sermon. And the sermon was about that it's harder for a rich man to go through with an eye and needle than to enter this, the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus said. And so that was what it is. Well, this point was, was this group got together after that sermon. They gave each other their 1040s, their tax returns. Wow. They're like, we're going to be accountable to each other. Mm. We're not just going to talk about giving. We're act- And I'm not saying people have to do that, but just having someone along the ride helping you think through these things, I think makes a world of difference. Mm. Wow. That is, a, that is really a big step, a, gr- a great step. I also, just in, as a grandfather, I'm thinking about what you've just said and thinking about, okay, how do I then also inculcate this kind of outlook and this participation in giving? Uh, among my grandkids. So mm. thanks, Jeff. That's a, that's a great suggestion. I not had a really, had not really even thought about that element. Well, have you ever been to like a, like a pancake breakfast for the Cub Scouts or something like that? Mm-hmm. Like the cutest thing in the world, the cutest thing in the world is not only seeing the father and the, or the, and the mother or whatever, they're working with their kids as they're serving pancakes or they're doing right. Like that's a really neat thing. Mm-hmm. Doing something together with someone else within your family or outside of your family, that that's a bond that I think is stronger than most other bonds that you can have. Mm-hmm. So I, I've got a couple other questions, um, but they would be switching now to th- think about some of the mechanics. Before I do that, Adrian or Roshan, are there other th- things that you want to make sure that you ask before we, we rotate over to mechanics? Uh, I'm kind of with you on that. Uh, the mechanics, uh, Jeff, you just mentioned donor advised funds where we talked about maybe some support organizations and some private foundations for some of those listeners or some of our, our viewers out there that want to, you know, start being more generous or looking at their, their assets or whatever they have right now and see what are some tactical ways they can start using it and trying to move more into a, more of a generous lifestyle or just planning for that. Can you kind of go over the features of it and go over like the basic definition of it so our viewers and our listeners can have a better understanding how if they want to be more actionable or get the process going, how they'd have a conversation about it. Yeah. So uh, this is what I get to do every day is talk about these type of things. But first of all, I just tell anybody writing a check or giving cash to anything you care about is a wonderful thing. All right. That's a wonderful thing. And by doing that, what happens? We all know whenever you, you keep track of your checks, just so you know, 
If you, if you ever get audited, I've been audited twice, both times by my giving percentages were out of line. Uh, what happens is they actually need the check. You think those letters are important from your charities? I will tell you the IRS is going to require you to get the check. Not saying you have to have it now. Now you can get a copy off. But it used to be an issue. And I have to tell you, I had to, I had to request a lot of that type of thing. So, but what do you, why do you do it? You get a charitable deduction, right? So if you think if you're in the 20% bracket and you make whatever, $10,000, right? By every dollar you get to deduct, right? It's like a 20% kicker. That's the point. You get to deduct it, right? So whatever tax bracket you're in, it can make sense to be giving, all right? You can do. So A, the I, and I always say one of the things we always say to people is that, uh, right, you're, you're, you are going to be generous this year. I promise. Each one of you, whether you know it or not, you will be generous. You're either going to give to the largest nonprofit in the world, which is the United States government, or you're going to give it to some other charity or, or church or something that you care for. You will give it to one of those two things. I promise you, you will. All right. So you decide how you want to do it. You know, Jesus, there's a great thing in the line. Uh, he gets he's being asked about, you know, do you pay taxes? And he's like, give to Caesars what is Caesars. But I'll always add, but don't give a penny more. <laughs> right? That's my point. So my point is I pay my taxes, right? We all pay our taxes. I do. I go right to the line. That's what I do. But I also try to make sure I only pay as much as I'm supposed to pay. And then I'm going to go give to the things I care about. So what do donor advised funds? So just think of it as a donor advised fund. That's the first thing I'll go through. It's the most simple. It's a charitable checking account. So any of you today can go online. There's there's all kinds of different donor advice funds. We're just one of them. Fidelity, all kinds of different people have them. Uh, what happened? In fact, Fidelity Charitable is the largest donor advice fund in the world. They say at this point it has over sixty five billion dollars on its balance sheet. So givers are using it. All right. So what happens? You put it in your charitable checking account, and you can do one of two things: you can invest it, so it earns dollars tax free. And then you can also at any point, like I say, point and click and have checks sent out to the charities you care for. All right. So let's say you're an attorney or whatever you might be and you get a bonus. Well, oftentimes at year end, your accountant's like, hey, if you're going to be generous, you know, it'd be probably smart because you have this income this year. Let's give this much. This much makes economic sense. So that's one way to be happy. I would argue, well, Find the things that you care about and give to what your heart, what, what you feel like you should do, right? But so you give those dollars. Well, sometimes there's a great book called When Helping Hurts, written by a great guy out of Atlanta. And uh, basically the idea is sometimes a large check, two things. One is if you write a large check to an organization, you're probably going to get bothered for many years down the line. Two, oftentimes writing a larger check to an organization can really affect that organization, that organization might not be ready to take those type of dollars, right? So the point being is now I can write the check to my charitable checking account, right? I can give those dollars. I get my tax deduction, which is key. Now, instead of giving, writing a $25,000 check at year end of that charity, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to give $5,000. I always try to trust people. Now, maybe if you really care about it, maybe get involved with that charity to help them, right? You know, we all have all kinds of skills. You like that was the book, Bob Buford's book, Halftime, that I read that then I did a program called the Master's Program. It's all about the idea of using your skill set. God gave you skills. You've worked your butt off all your life to hone those skills. Right. Well, now let's use those skills for greater good. That's all. That's all that it is. So that's how I ended up in NCF, plus a lot of other things. But the idea is you have this donor advice fund, right? So now, now I write the check there. I get my, so now my accountant's happy and I, let's say, maximized my efficiency for my taxes this year, right? Well, now over time, I can give those dollars out. So that's all, that's all a donor advice fund is. And the key is you can also, over the last 10 years with the stock market up every year for the last 10 years, right? That's one reason why these donor advice funds have grown so much. Because you might have an invested in mutual funds and different things. The market's going up on average, whatever, 13% a year, whatever it might be. Well, that's growing. So as it grows, right, you have more dollars to give out. So it's a pretty neat thing, right? So that's one. So that's that's the simple one, a donor advice fund. And you can use it for a variety of reasons. People always talk about cash, but I'd say one of our sayings is that 
Friends don't let friends give cash. <laughs> okay? Friends don't let friends give cash. You guys are advisors. One of the number one things we'll talk to advisors about is you might get lucky and have two meetings a year with your with your with your clients, right? Usually you'll have a year end one. And what's the big thing you're thinking about? It's rebalancing, right? We're rebalancing our portfolio. I've got my winners, right? I've got my big winners and we've got our losers. Well, what are we going to do? Well, typically what you do is you might say, hey, that position's too big. So now I'm going to maybe sell a little bit of that position down, maybe sell some of my losers at the same time. So my gains and my losses offset. So the client's not right. So the client now is not paying taxes on it. But what I say is to the giver, your client, I say, hey, you know what? Don't write a check to the charity. You guys will love this. Write a check to your advisor. Why are you going to write a check to your advisor? Have your advisor give those stock gains, your biggest stock gains that they want to rebalance, have them give those to your donor advice fund, right? You can give a stock. Well, why would you want to give an appreciated asset? Well, this is the key. The charity, the donor advice fund, or you can give it directly to your church or whatever you care about, their odds are usually 98% of the time, they're not going to pay capital gains. So first of all, always make sure it's a long-term capital gain. Short-term gains you don't want to ever give because you only get a basis deduction. Basis is the amount you actually have paid for the asset. You want a fair market value deduction. You want all that appreciation, right? So if I buy a stock for 100 and it's worth 1000 give that stock. Normally, I'd pay, what, $900 on my capital appreciation. So 20% times 900 is what? 180 bucks, right? Guess what? Charity's not going to pay that. Your donor advice fund's not going to pay it. So what have you done? You've given more because almost $200 more is going to go to the, your donor advice fund to the charities you care about. And here's more importantly, what are you doing smart financially? Well, what can your advisor do? All right, well, you were going to write a check for $1,000. Instead, you gave $1,000 in stock. Write a, write a check for $1,000 to your advisor. What do they do? They might love that stock. And they might say, hey, what I would have bought, or maybe I'm going to buy more of that. Well, but what have they done? They've raised the basis because now they're buying the stock at a higher price. So now down the line, when you go to sell it, you'll pay less capital gains. But hopefully, so that's what I always say is like for advisors, once you have that generosity question with your giver, with your client, right, they get to give more. And more importantly, now you have a really neat conversation at year end. Hey, here's what we're going to do. And we always tell, like I say, give your winners, always give your winners. Keep your losers or sell them. Why? Because now you have a tax loss. You're going to do that anyway. Well, now you have a tax loss to go against other things that you have gains against, right? So what we're doing is it's a multiplying effect, right? So here's the neat thing. We talked about public equities. You can do it with any capital asset. Now, defining a capital asset can get complicated, but typically it's anything that you can buy that goes up in value. But certain ones, the IRS has said kind of like, hey, that's not a very good gift. You're not going to get that tax efficiency. So I'm going to just give one of those bad cases. And that might be art. You always hear about people giving art to museums and colleges, right? There's a reason why they give them to those institutions. They give them to institutions that are going to use it in their charitable purpose. Because what the IRS says is if you give a collectible like art, to a museum that's going to show it, you actually get a fair market value deduction, right? So you get you get what it's worth today versus if you gave that art to NCF or your church because it's not in their charitable purpose, you're only going to get a deduction for your basis, what you paid for it, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of things. And this is what I always say to advisors and givers. This is a great way for me and, the, and you guys, everybody, to start a conversation. It's a conversation. Every year you're thinking different things. And we have so many givers that come to us with an idea. All right. They're going to give a business interest. I have a, I have a two brothers right now. <laughs> they, uh, they own a pretty, they, they make porta potties and they're, and they're selling their business. But when we went through the structure of the business, once again, there's a lot of IRS regulations around this, but they, they're going to give it to the giving fund, their DAF, right? But what happened is the type of structure they have is called an S corp. 
S corps are great from a tax perspective for you personally. Right now you pay less on that rate than you would if you were paying on your personal taxes, right? So that's why you're set up that way. But what happens is the IRS says, yeah, but if you give that, we're gonna kind of, what I, how I explain it is, we're gonna make you pay that back. The charity is gonna pay that, all that efficiency back. So oftentimes those, now you can do things to make them better. So once again, it's a conversation. So they came to us, they're in the process of selling the company. Key is on, on any appreciated asset, if you're gonna give it, you have to give it prior to the signing of a purchase and sale agreement, okay? LOIs are fine, but if you've already signed something to get to sell it, you've given up that opportunity mm. per the IRS, mm. okay? Not my rules, IRS rules. So long and short, what happens is in this case, we started talking to them. That's what they thought they could give. But oftentimes, another thing we often talk to business, if you got everyone that's owned a business, oftentimes you're told, Hey, put your real estate outside your business, right? Mm -hmm. Have it have your wife be a, it's an LLC and pay rent to your wife, right? What what a great thing. Mm -hmm. Well, so we started talking to them and they actually have real estate, about $8 million in real estate in an LLC outside of the business. Well, guess what? Real estate is a wonderful gift, all right? For two reasons. One is it doesn't have all those efficiencies typically. If it has a lot of debt, that's one thing that could knock it down. They didn't have any debt. So they're going to give us a piece of that. But here's the key. You and I, we pay income tax when we receive rent and lease income, right? We all pay income tax on it. Well, guess what? When a charity receives passive income, it pays, typically it pays no tax. Hmm. So in this case, they're going to give some of their real estate to us. So they're going to get that deduction, fair market value deduction. But more importantly, they don't want us to sell it. And what are we going to do? We're going to actually work on trying to set up the new lease arrangements with the new company, maybe even get those lease payments up higher. Because what happens now as income gets paid to the charity, we don't pay any income tax on that. That money then flows into their giving fund. So now we're multiplying. We're multiplying it on the gift. And now we're going to multiply it going forward on all that charitable, on that passive income. That it receives. So that's one thing. That's a donor. A donor advised fund can do a lot of neat things. Before you right? move on from donor advised fund, Jeff. So let me just make sure I understood that. So in this case, they they because the business can the the business that they continue to own the operating company as opposed to the real estate still can deduct every lease payment that it's making on real oh, estate. Yeah. Then that essentially is a direct write off as opposed to having to, to you know clear the hurdle of let's say their standard deduction before it starts to get into the deductible category. That's one. And then the second thing that you said, which I didn't understand is, is that you said the S corp, unfortunately, if you tried to give S corp interests that the IRS is going to want to claw back some of the benefits that you've received, but you, you were making, just to make sure that I understood that you were making that as a distinction between the S corp and an LLC where an LLC, if you gave LLC units, you would not face that complication. Is that, did I understand typically, you correctly? Yeah. Typically that's the case. And that's why I say it's a conversation. So they came mm -hmm. to us thinking about an S-Corp gift. I'll, I'll admit, anytime someone comes with us and they have their ownership structure as S-Corp, I cringe a little bit because <sighs> I'm like, odds are it's not going to be a great, efficient gift, right? Because we're all about, a, I want to help you give away your the maximum amount possible. Yes. But, and I always say to people this, like if you want to talk about your living bucket, there's three buckets we all have. I think living bucket, your IRS bucket, and your charitable bucket right? All I want to do is I'm not going to touch your living bucket. I, I gladly talk to you about your living bucket, but that's not what I do. That's not right. But I'll talk to you about it. I'd love to talk to you about that bucket. But what I really do is I try to talk to you about your IRS bucket and your charitable bucket. And I want, it's like a great picture we have in our, and it's just a little thing of the dollars going from the IRS bucket mm. to your charitable bucket, right? And there's certain ways that are better than others. So that's when we start the conversation. Started with an S-Corp gift. We talk to the giver about their balance sheet. We find out the real estate's outside of it. Oh, probably a better gift. So then we do a little research. It is. And then more importantly, we're not going to sell it right now. We're going to continue to own it because the income that that will generate, we will not pay tax on and it'll end up going into their giving fund. Mm -hmm. Right? So we multiply it many ways over. So that's a donor advice fund, okay? Mm -hmm. Everybody's heard of this, and I always call it a sin of pride, and it's not necessarily a sin of pride. You have a private foundation, right? Everybody, I hit it off big. I get a private foundation. I put my family name on it. 
gosh darn it, that's a great thing. And it is a great thing. It is a great thing because everything that goes in a private foundation will go to a charity someday. That's a wonderful thing. Amen. Wonderful thing. Private foundations, two things. It's an annuity for your attorney. It's an annuity for your accountant. Uh, They're complicated. All right. They're not cheap to set up. In fact, at this point, if you talk to most attorneys that deal with it, they'll say that to really do a private foundation, I'm being told now they're saying 20 million investable assets into the foundation. I have others that say 10. Okay. That's a big number. You don't know how many people we work with, and I'm going to tell you a story that have had private foundations set up by matriarch and patriarch. Older, older generations have set these up. There's not as many assets in them anymore. They're complicated. Oftentimes they can be a hassle for the families as they're working together, right? So what will happen is we'll start to talk to them and we'll just ask one simple question. What are you doing with the foundation dollars? 99% of them tell us, well, we're just sending it to other 5013Cs, the things we care about. Well, guess what? You can do that with a donor advised fund. You don't need a private foundation. You can call it, right? You can call it like Adrian. I could call it the Nicholson Private Foundation Fund. And that's what all the checks would say, right? You can have your kids help you think through all the stuff that you would in a foundation. Well, guess what? You've probably just taken the cost down. You know, average foundation, fifty dollars to $60,000 a year, minimum, probably. You know, it, a lot of people say it's a lot more. It's a percentage of whatever the assets are. All right. So that's one thing. Right. So you can do a lot of the things that you would do in a private foundation. So you don't have to have a private foundation. The other things we talked about stock. If you give stock to a private foundation that's appreciated, you get the same tax benefit as a donor advised fund. There are also limits to the amount that you can do in a year. Private foundations is actually less. The other thing about a private family foundation is that You have to give away 5% of your net assets every single year. Well, as you're investing things, sometimes that can be hard near year and figuring out how much it is. Well, there's a significant penalty if you don't do that. The other thing is, unlike a donor advised fund, you actually pay a 1% tax on the earnings of all those sales of your assets. Okay, so the efficiency, the efficiency is not there. But here's what the other thing I tell you. If you want to employ your family, a family foundation is the way to go. You can't employ your family in a donor advised fund. Okay. But more importantly, I always say, I always ask them, if you're only giving to other charities, we probably have some other vehicles that can make it easier and cheaper, less complicated for you to do. If you want to employ family, family foundation, and then more importantly, if you ever, what we call is programming. And actually, that's what the IRS calls it. Programming would be this. Uh, Roshan, if you have, let's say you you care for after-school programs, and you're like, you know what? I've seen them. I don't think they're doing them well. I want to, A, put together a program. I want to employ people. I want to go to the schools, and I want to run this program. Well, guess what? You can only do that in a private foundation. You can't do that in a donor-advised fund. A donor-advised fund, the dollars have to be sent out to another 5013C and or church. Those are the two designations, okay? Churches actually have a different de- designation than 5013C. But those are the two ways dollars, way you can send dollars out, okay? So if you want to do programming and employ family, private foundation is the way to go. Very simple, right? Then there's one other way, and this we might be getting a little too complicated, but if for a donor advice fund, they have something called a supporting organization. Think of it as a private family foundation that sits underneath another charity. So like underneath National Christian Foundation, you could have your own supporting organization. For us, I will tell you, we say minimum you should have, we think you should have $5 million to go into it to do a supporting organization. We do it with less, but that's because just from an efficiency standpoint, we think that makes sense. Well, what happens with the supporting organization? Well, now we can do programming we still can't pay family. We can pay for expenses of family. Like I have a, I have a very a family we get to work with. They take their kids on mission trips because that's where the supporting organization actually sends their dollars to. 
So when they go on a mission trip, the supporting organization can pay those costs. No problem. Donor advised fund can't do that. They also, I always say I get to work with uh, crazy investor types, crazy business types. We have an individual that sold a, uh, uh, I don't get to work with this guy, but he, he sold a uh, store, self-storage business, which a lot of people want to talk about because they're great cash flow machines. He built a pretty big business and he sold it for in the B's. And so he, he got those dollars in and he had a four or five year non-compete. He set up a supporting org. He's doing some things he likes and investing, but now he's done. And he's like, you know what? I know this business. So what is he doing right now? Well, underneath the supporting org right now, he's building out a new self-storage business. Hmm. Well, here's the thing you got to hmm. remember. This is a big distinction of charities and businesses. Charities do have to pay income taxes, right? Or if not, we would all go set up our businesses underneath the charity and not pay a tax. It's called unrelated business income tax. You'll hear it called UBIT or UBTI. Basically, the point is, is that the charity, if it's going to go do something that's not in its purpose, like so operating business, what happens? We're going to have to pay tax on it. But here I will tell you this, because of the way we're set up and all the dollars that go out, we typically pay about one third of the taxes that you or I would pay on that operating income. Hmm. So he still gets a very efficient way to generate income and to give it away, right? So there's a lot of neat, So, but my point is under, under a supporting organization, you can do a lot of really neat things. I, I, I came out of the trading private equity world so I do get to I get to go out and work with a lot of people in that world in Chicago, San Francisco, New York, and we try to help them think through ways to set up their funds. And then more importantly, once they have these appreciated deals, if they're going to sell them, how can we give a piece of that deal prior to signing the purchase and sale? Hmm. Right. So we're always and so some of them. And then once they're in the DAF, the donor advice fund, it's probably not going to be able to go like if you're a great private equity guy, you're like, hey, I know this business. I want my donor advice fund to actually invest in my deals. They can't do it. We can't do it. Mm. All right. Most of you can't. But guess what? If you have a supporting organization, you actually probably can do some of those, what I say, serial investment people, serious deal. You can invest in that. Now, the one thing the IRS, no matter in, in our structure and the supporting org is, you cannot get paid to do that. Okay. Once again, you cannot get paid. That's called an excess benefit. So that individual that gave us the is giving us the real estate, even though he might manage the real estate, guess what? I can, we can't pay him to manage that real estate. Mm -hmm. We could pay someone else, but we can't pay him. That's called an excess benefit. So there's a lot of rules around it. So I would just tell people there's these three things, right? There's a supporting organization that's underneath another charity. There's a donor advised fund, which is the simplest. And then there's a private foundation. And I always say, I have plenty of people that have private foundations that we work with that also have donor advised funds. Why would they do that? Well, really, it's two reasons. One is anonymity, right? I don't know, hopefully I said that word right. If you want to, under a donor advised fund, like with us, you can check a box. And basically, the check goes out without your name on it. So, right. So, Adrian, you got something you want to support, but I don't want that business development officer calling me every three weeks. All right. Well, what happens? The check goes out. Let's say you sent from Fidelity Charitable. It would just have Fidelity Charitable's name on. That's it. They would not know it's from you. Right. I have an elderly gentleman that wanted to basically almost pay for the church building. He's like, my pastor, no one in the church knows that I could do this. So he was like so excited when we started working with him. Mm. He was able to give a sizable check to his church. I mean, a sizable check for the small little church. But basically he gave that and he gave it anonymous, but which is kind of me is a little sad, but he wanted to do that in that way because mm -hmm. he, he was, I don't want people to think about me differently. Right. I don't want to be that person that people come to every time they got another project. Yeah, I want to hear about it. I want to have the, you know, the good Lord move me to give, right? So anonymous is big. So that's one thing. All right. The second thing is if you have a private foundation, you have to give away that 5% per year. Well, under current tax law, if the private foundation sets up a giving fund, a donor advised fund, that counts towards their 5%. So oftentimes near year end, 
when you're worried about how much your net assets have gone up from, you know, you don't know what the stock market's going to do or how your investments are doing, right? A very quick way to make sure you're over that 5% is, hey, I can do it to my giving fund, right? I can do it to my donor advised fund. It counts towards that calculation. And then I can still use it to give out over the next number of years. So what we always say is like each of those things we talked about, those are tools. You have a tool belt, right? So oftentimes you'll use different products. I have got a great giver that gives us business interest, private equity guy, but he, he's not religious and, and, he, and he's like, he doesn't feel comfortable at NCF. He uses national philanthropic, right? I think many of you might know them, but what we do is we do, cause they won't do the business interest things. We do it. And then you can transfer from one donor advice fund to another. Hmm. So we do all that. It comes into his account. His name's Rick. And I'll always like, uh, Missy, who works with us, will say, "Hey, Rick, I'm gonna I'm gonna send these dollars over to your other fund because that's where we know he likes to manage the funds, mm-hmm. and also that group, his advisor. Many advisors will manage. You can manage the donor advice fund investments. For us, it has to be over three hundred thousand. Well, this is a way for his his private client person, right, to kind of manage the whole spectrum the way he wanted it to be done. Mm-hmm. So there's reasons why you want to do it, but what are we gonna do? I get to help him maximize his giving by actually working on the business gift. Mm -hmm. So I know I've said a lot of different things, but that's kind of those three things and how they're defined. Jeff, that's incredible. I would have, I mean, you did all of that just (laughs) in such a, such a full, fully orbed way. I really am amazed that you could just kind of walk us through all of those pros and cons about this. I'm sure that some of our listeners are thinking, dang, I didn't even know some of these tools existed and are wanting to learn more. So how, number one, how would they reach out and contact you? And number two, in addition to being able to contact you, how would they go about learning more? So I would say, first of all, there's all kinds of donor advice funds out there. I don't like to necessarily push us. It's more of, right, you can go on to any of them, just type in donor advice fund, Someone's going to come up, probably Fidelity, Charitable, or Schwab, or us, National Christian Foundation. And what it does is you can just click on the page. There's all kinds of resources. For us, it's ncfgiving.com, right? If you go on there, there's all kinds of resources under generous, under just different products and different ways. And then we also have a huge section of stories. It's just people's personal stories. Mm. Eric, you're probably on our Saturday 7 email list. It goes out to 35,000 people. I hear more people comment. It's funny. Like I'm supposed to be talking to our givers. I get more givers talking to me because they read something on a Saturday morning Mm. about one family and what they did. It's a story. Mm. How it impacted that family. I Hey, I read this. Wow. What a neat story. Hey, I was, th- and then you get the, I was thinking this, oh, okay, let's have that conversation. That's what I always tell people. It's a conversation. Mm-hmm. Let's start a conversation and we'll figure it out. And at the end of the day, I, so ncfgiving.com for me, it's, you can email me at jwallace, J-W-A-L-L-A-C-E at ncfgiving.com. If you go on the ncfgiving.com forward slash Chicago, you can also see my bio on there and you can click that and email me. But like I say, if you just hit the email to ncf.com, if you just learn more about, an email will come into our national office. And wherever you're based in the United States, we have 31 offices around the country. All right. We probably we probably have a local office pretty close to you. And if not, we have national salespeople that kind of work in those areas we don't have an office. They'll call you. They'll email you and they'll start to talk to you about it. Hmm. And like, like I just, I'm sorry, I just got an email that came across from Faith Driven Entrepreneur. That's the other things that we I, that I get so excited about. I get it. My big thing is connecting. I connect people on projects. I connect people on their thoughts. I was thinking about this. If I don't know somebody that might be involved in that project, like right now, I have a giver. Great case. I have a giver, a farmer that's giving us uh, 200 acres just outside Chicago. Hmm. Okay. 200 acres. I don't know if you guys know about farm. I have still, we still have a farm. All right. Farmland has gone up tremendously over the number of years. This area, it's worth about $15,000 an acre, but there's an interchange that's getting ready to go in. So he's going to give that acreage. Long and short, he thinks it's worth probably $40,000. But here's the neat thing. The reason we couldn't have a meeting when I'm in town next week is him and his wife are going down to Texas for a show called The Chosen. I don't know if you've ever heard of The Chosen. It's one of the largest streaming shows in the United States. 
Look it up. You can see it. But they're going down to be extras for two weeks oh, on the show. Right? <laughs> He's like, I'm going to go stand in Texas in the heat. <laughs> I, they don't pay. I, I have to pay for where I'm getting down there. I have to do everything. But they just want to be a part of this community. And this community does some amazing things. So that's what I get to do. I get to connect people on ideas of what they want to do or just mm. hearing stories or from the investing side, like faith-driven entrepreneur, faith-driven invest. There's all kinds of books that we get to tell people about. So yeah, that's how you do it. And we have a lot of wonderful people and they can help you in all, in all kinds of different ways. Well, that's fantastic, Jeff. It, it, you truly do sound like a connector and just in terms of your personal style. I imagine it, it's people f feel a, a, a great ease and comfort with you and just in terms of sort of talking about what they're trying to accomplish and knowing that and trusting that you'll be able to help them do that without necessarily sort of pointing them to what it is that you personally are doing. Adrian or Roshan, any other final comments or questions one that i think is an easy one for you jeff how how small can someone start investing in a donor advised fund that's a great question because you know what every time when you talk about stories you always talk yeah. about zeros right you talk about big numbers so here's the thing many many donor advised funds do have minimums they could be five ten you know some of the bigger one or some of the different ones could have a much larger so I would say is, but I will tell you, there are plenty that it's zero. You can start with one dollar. Hmm. For us, it's a for us it's zero. All right, just so you know. So you can start one tomorrow or zero. There is a cost, just so you all know. We got to be. We should let everybody know. Most of them, and it ranges in cost. Ours is one percent of the dollars in the account for the year. So at the end of every month, whatever's in the account, one twelfth of one percent is charged as a fee. So that's how I get paid. That's how NCFers get paid. That's how we do what we do, right? That's the, the cost and it, it ranges. There are some that are cheaper. There are some that are more expensive, but most of them, the cheaper have much higher minimums for us. And if you have nothing in your account, you could go on ncfgiving.com, open a fund. You can open a fund in less than five minutes and it costs you nothing. And even if you never put a dollar into it, you'll never get charged. But what you might want to do, and this is the last thing I know we're near our time, is for estate planning, for any of you that have estate planning, and we haven't even got into the IRAs and all that, and there's some great things about IRAs, but donor advised funds can be great vehicles for you to give out of your state. And what is it? It's a way of tying legacy, meaning bringing your family into giving, right? So because just one quick thing is that your IRAs and your 401ks, I don't know what you guys are going to say, but I will tell you, they are terrible assets to give to your family. All right. Many of them are overfunded at this point because of what the markets have done over the last number of years. So I would tell anybody, first thing I tell them is if you're over seven and a half and you're giving it all, you should be giving what they call a qualified charitable distribution. That's how you should give. Number one. So I say walk in a room and I can tell somebody, hey, uh, this room's on average age is over 70. Here we're going to go. We're going to go. We're going to talk to you about QCDs, qualified charitable distribution. And the key is you once again, point and click, send it to the charities you care about. What does it do? It doesn't get included in income. A lot of great reasons why you don't want income from Medicare, all kinds of reasons why you don't want it. Okay. So that's one, right? You have that QCD. And the other thing is it's, it's a bad asset to actually give to your kids because it used to be like I'm 57 years old, my father's 85, and I would say my mother passed away a year ago. He's getting close, I think. God willing, he's ready, so that'd be one. I mean, he gets to go to a much better place. But if he goes, well, what does he do? He gives those assets. That If he gave us that IRA asset, what happens? He gives it to me in probably my maximum earning years. So what does that mean? I'm probably near the top tax rate. Right. Well, in the old days, if I, I received an inherited IRA, I got to use that. They call it the required minimum distribution. I used to get to do that over my lifetime. Well, three years ago now, they took that away. Now you have to use it within 10 years. So what's happening? People are inheriting IRAs at the highest time of their paying tax probably. Right. So it's usually not a good thing. So that's the other thing I would tell anybody that's thinking about estate planning is give from your IRAs and your 401ks. If, you're, if you have a generous bone in your body, it's really easy. I guarantee you can go online and you just click, hey, give it so much to my this church, give so much to this charity, whatever it might be. Give from that and use the other assets or some other, other better assets 
to do from the trust to say give to your kids and or other other people. So that's that's that. And then the qualified charitable distribution is a really important thing. Jeff, thanks for re- reinforcing that point too, because we we do uh, we're big fans of the QCD and uh, absolutely do lobby for people to use that once they're eligible at seventy and a half. Uh, so, Roshan and Adrian, any other any other question or, or comment before we adjourn? No, just Jeff. Thank you very much. Set. This has yeah. been great. Yeah, they're like, how about we shut that guy up, <laughs> Jeff? <laughs> listen, thank you so much. You've covered so so much, and really really grateful that you would uh, come out and spend your morning with us and listeners. Like we said, if you've got questions about this, you've gotten now Jeff's. Uh, contact information. You've heard about that, the NCF in particular. You've heard about multiple organizations that, that offer donor advised funds. So, you know, please, uh, if you're motivated by this or you have other questions, you know, reach out. And if you have questions for us, you also can find our information for contacting us at our website, which is retirementlifestyleshow.com. And there you'll find all of our contact information and can shoot us a question. And we'll be happy to address that in an, in an upcoming episode of the show. So Jeff, thank you again, Roshan, Adrian, thank you so much. Listeners, we ask you to please like subscribe, uh, give us five stars, leave us a review, everything. If you like the show, share it with a friend. We'll be back next week with a, with another guest to talk about an amazing journey of walking a, a a pilgrim's path in Spain and Portugal known as Camino de Santiago. And you'll hear just what that experience f- uh, as a fresh report from one of my clients who's, who's just come back about why he did it, what he experienced and what he's learned from it. So th- join us next time. Thanks so much.